Hi, and welcome back to the Byland Clinic podcast. The, the past few episodes had taken some time to talk about different learning disabilities and what those look like and, and how we might assess them. Um, but what I really have been wanting to do and I'm really excited to do about today to do today is to talk more about uh, what we do, um, you know, to, to help young people that have uh, that have learning disabilities and uh, kind of get beyond, you know, just what it is, but but how we can really help. And when I started thinking about this, uh, I sort of went through my mind in terms of people that I've met over the years uh, and somebody who I thought might be really good to come on and, and talk about reading disabilities, uh, to talk about dyslexia. And the first person that came to mind uh, was uh, my colleague, Natalie Powell, uh, who uh, has been um, assessing and treating uh, kids with dyslexia for a number of years. Uh, and I've always been really impressed with her, uh, both with her assessments um, and uh, her, successful, her successful treatment of kids with dyslexia. So Natalie, thank you so much for agreeing to come on and, and talk about this topic with me. Well, thanks, James, and thanks to that really nice introduction. I appreciate it. And I also love reading your reports, and I like how we we assess different areas, but we always kind of come to the same conclusions about the kids. So we're like-minded, which I appreciate. Yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, it's nice when um, to work with another professional and you sort of see similar types of outcomes. And, um, and, and yeah, in it, you're right, they're, they're different. Um, and one of the things that's really nice about your reports is the level of detail you get into, you know, around their reading and the sort of pattern and errors that they're making and, and what that suggests and how you might go about treatment. Um, I'm always super impressed with the level of detail that, that you get into around reading. It's really super impressive. Thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, I gave a little bit of an introduction there, but was hoping maybe you could share with us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, perhaps what got you into doing this and, and maybe talk a little bit about the services that you provide. So I'm a certified educational therapist and a certified structured literacy dyslexia interventionist. So my entire practice is working with kids with dyslexia and every service that I offer is around dyslexia. So I offer dyslexia assessments, joint assessments with psychologists, dyslexia therapy, and 504 and IEP advocacy, not necessarily as an advocate per se, but as just an expert in what proper dyslexia interventions and assessment should look like. Yeah. Um, I also have started coaching um, speech and language pathologists who want to start adding print and more phonemic awareness into their sessions as well. And I go yeah. over with them how they can use this huge knowledge base they already have about language and child development and just wow. add in one more element, which is print. Wow, that's so those huge. Are the sessions. Yeah, so those, I, awesome. I do a lot of things, but it's all dyslexia. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, and, and you know um, more about this topic than, than anybody that I know. So I'm oh, wow. <laughs> again, <laughs> really, uh, really, really glad to have you, um, you know, here today. So, you know, maybe, you know, one of the things, um, you know, everything that you do, uh, you know, to help these kids is, is just amazing. Um, and, you know, you mentioned a few things uh, in there. I mean, you mentioned that you were an educational therapist. Um, you mentioned uh, your certification in structured literacy instruction. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how somebody like yourself as an education therapist might be different than, you know, other service providers out there? That's a great question because I think awareness of dyslexia in general is increasing and I've seen it increase a lot just in, you know, in the Bay Area over the last six years that I've been doing this, but I don't think awareness of the proper solutions for dyslexia yeah. is increasing in tandem. So yes, this is a very important question. So an educational therapist is very different from a tutor. These are not comparable jobs. An educational therapist has, first of all, has to have a bachelor's degree and some sort of higher level degree. So I have a postgraduate certificate in educational therapy. So you either have to have that or a master's or both. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be a member of a professional organization, do continuing education, have many different trainings of different approaches to rewire the brain of the child you're working with, not just help them with homework. So you go very in depth into remediation, 
as an educational therapist. And because you're filling in gaps, you have to really understand how the brain works versus a tutor, which could have any level of knowledge. They could be as knowledgeable as an educational therapist, or they could just be a subject matter specialist, or it could be a high school student that's doing peer tutoring. So an ed therapist is very specific. Now for the second part of your question, for my other certification in structured literacy. So that is a dyslexia specific qualification that signifies that I've done a lot of extra professional development and trainings in dyslexia intervention specifically. Ed therapy is very broad, just like speech and language therapy, OT. And we all have our own niche within that and mine is dyslexia. So ed therapists, could specialize in ADHD, executive functioning, dyslexia, or work with kids with any learning profile. So it's really broad. Yeah. No, that, thank you. That, that's super helpful. Cause I, I'm just not sure that, you know, the, the general public, right. That, that all parents out there are going to know the difference between, you know, an educational therapist and, and other, you know, support providers, including, including tutors. Right. And, and, and what you guys are doing, you know, really is, uh, like you said, remediating these skills, rewiring the brain, um, you know, helping the child to be able to function more successfully, not just, you know, help them complete their homework, you know, perhaps mm-hmm. in the case of a, a, a peer tutor. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, earlier, you know, you, a moment ago, you were mentioning too about, uh, just sort of like the awareness of dyslexia increasing, which, which I totally agree with. Right. And, and you said, potential problem now, right, is that, you know, the, the level of understanding in terms of effective treatment um, has yes. not sort of kept pace with that. And, and that's definitely mm-hmm. something I want to get into. Um, but one of the things I've noticed, too, with just sort of this increased conversation around dyslexia um, is not always uh, like increased awareness, but not, not always a real accurate understanding in terms of what dyslexia is. And mm-hmm. I was wondering if you might be able to share with us what you see as being some of the sort of key signs of dyslexia, um, you know, perhaps mm-hmm. at different developmental stages and, mm-hmm. and some of the misconceptions you come across out there about mm-hmm. dyslexia. Oh, there are so many. So this, so here's the, the big one. The big one is dyslexia just impacts reading yeah. and that the reading issue would be very significant. Whereas as a rule, dyslexia presents so differently in every child, reading may or may not be the biggest issue. And dyslexia does impact every academic subject in one way or another, because it's an overall different pattern of brain organization. So a student may appear to read fairly well, but they can still have dyslexia. Um, Math could be a bigger issue, for example. And then there's such a range, right? So I also work with teachers who they will say, oh, I've had one student with dyslexia, which of course is not true because uh, one in five people in in the general population has dyslexia, but they'll think that particular student is then the model of what dyslexia looks like. So then if they have another struggling student who doesn't resemble that one student they know of that was identified as having dyslexia, they think, oh, this, this other student can't have dyslexia. And it does have so many variations. So that that's one that I come across a lot. There are the very pervasive ones that I think are kind of getting dispelled now these days, I would say, seeing words backwards, of course, mm-hmm. that's not true at all. Um, yeah. common, that dyslexia common misconception is rare. Though. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, that it's a good idea to wait and see if it's dyslexia because they may just be late bloomers. Yeah. There are very few late bloomers. And if you wait and see, you're going to miss the best window for intervention. Yeah. So those, those are the main misconceptions that I've seen. And then in terms of signs of dyslexia, so dyslexia, because it's not just a reading disorder, it, the signs of dyslexia can be identified as early as preschool. And a lot of the indicators are within speech and language or within the OT realm. So within speech and language, that could be misusing irregular verbs. I have a lot of students who will say, I builded something instead of I built, Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. 
Um, I have a student just the other day. She said, I go to school. Yeah. Said, Went. So errors like that. Uh, trouble with semantic memory. So memorizing basic facts that kids are kind of expected to get naturally, like the alphabet yeah. or their address, the months, the days of the week. Speech issues are a big indicator because that in, in and of itself, a speech issue is a phonological processing issue. So those kids are then at a bigger risk of dyslexia. Yeah. And then within the OT realm, problems with fine motor issues, pencil grip, uh, poor handwriting, problems differentiating left and right. So all of these things are not even related to reading, right? They're just pre-literacy skills, but they're visible before a child even starts learning to read. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I, I, I think um, you talked about, you know, some of the misconceptions about dyslexia and, and one I hear, you know, certainly in the schools is, you know, we can't, you know, we can't determine if a child has this reading disorder until third grade, for example, oh, right. Uh, when, when clearly there's, there's signs that we should be um, attending to uh, even before kids enter school um, and uh, in areas where we could be intervening even earlier, which, um, uh, you know, something I want to get into in here in a minute too, in terms of just the importance of early identification and treatment of dyslexia. Right, exactly. The earlier, the better. And you have nothing to lose, right? Because if it turns out it's not dyslexia, then they basically just got enrichment. Right. But if it is dyslexia, then they got the remediation. So it's really yeah. a win-win. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. Like you're, you're, you're not harming the child by providing them the, the additional instruction, right? You're, you're, you're only helping them in either situation. And, and, you know, if you didn't provide it, right, then, then kids are really missing out on that critical period of time when they can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really, really close the gap. Um, you know, an, another thing, you know, as we're sort of talking about, you know, uh, some of the misconceptions around dyslexia or that, you know, all kids with dyslexia look the same. You know, another thing that I've, uh, well, came across in literature a number of years ago, but hearing more and more now is this concept of stealth dyslexia. Can, can you share with us a little bit about what stealth dyslexia is and how that might be perhaps misunderstood or maybe even overlooked by the school when it comes mm. to dyslexia? So I actually just gave a presentation on this for an OT clinic oh, because wow. A lot of kids that have this type of dyslexia are quote unquote OT kids. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the kids that I've assessed with self dyslexia have been referrals from the OT clinic where I rent space. Uh -huh. And these kids, it's, it's called stealth because it is very hard to identify within standardized testing measures because uh -huh. oftentimes these kids are highly intelligent or even gifted. And they are so good at compensating for their reading issues with their language skills that they score average or even above average. So in a wow. school evaluation, there, there's going to be no discrepancy. Um, and the student's going to look like an average or even advanced reader when in yeah. fact they're just compensating. Yeah. Um, so the weakest area for these kids, so as I was mentioning earlier, it's usually not reading because it's easier for them to compensate on that because of their language skills. Writing is usually the big sticking point for these kids. A lot of anxiety around writing, avoidance, OT for handwriting, fine motor skills, sensory issues. And again, those are the issues that are going to be most visible in the classroom but teachers are not going to look at those as signs of dyslexia. It's probably just going to end up being an OT referral. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, and, and, and for some of these kids, uh, you know, at least in the school system, uh, not for 504, but, you know, um, under, uh, you know, IDA, the special education regulations, you know, if, if they're only looking at handwriting, that, that, that there's not a, um, like a path to eligibility and services that way, mm -hmm. you know, which, mm -hmm. which could then really limit a lot of kids access to the, to the supports that they need. Right. Exactly. Wow. And I guess it's important so, to mention too, that um, they do have the traditional dyslexic deficit. So I don't want to mislead anybody. They, they do sure. have issues with phonological processing, but they are 
you have to dig deeper to find them. So, it, you know, in the assessment we give for phonological processing, the CTOP, mm -hmm. the kids are not timed with their responses. So a lot of the kids that I test with self dyslexia do well on the CTOP. Mm -hmm. But if I give them a measure where they have to give those answers within a certain time frame, then they struggle. Yeah, they do still have the deficits. But again, you have to really dig. Yeah, I've noticed similar things, you know, or, or even just the, the, the complexity of the phonological processing tasks, right? Sort of some of the sort of lower level phonological awareness tasks, they do really, really well, right? And those right. language skills really help them to kind of... Um, mm -hmm you know, sort of, uh, you know, think through, uh, what's mm -hmm. being asked of them, but, but that obviously, like you said, that really slows them down in doing that and, and in doing the phonological, more complex phonological processing tasks. So for, for those of, uh, out there listening, we start to kind of get into this, uh, you know, using language ourselves, right. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to other people, but, you know, I think about phonological processing is like, you know, our ability to, you know, discriminate between sounds, know where one sound ends and the next one begins, be able to blend sounds together to form words, be able to sort of spatially arrange sounds uh, to create new words. Um, and, uh, and kids that struggle with that really struggle with reading um, because now uh, the uh, system of print that we've created, right, where these uh, either these symbols or combination of symbols represent each one of those sounds, um, you know, suddenly it becomes very, very difficult. But, uh, you know, some of the more complex tasks I've noticed, not just, you know, identifying sounds or blending sounds, but, um, you know, but deleting sounds within words, rearranging right. sounds in words, then suddenly it starts to get, you know, more difficult. It, it's harder for them to kind of close the gap on those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I like what you mentioned too, in terms of the, the speed piece, uh, you know, I, I think increasingly in our assessments, just doing more of that, right. Not just, not just assessing how well they can, uh, you know, decode, right. Or sound out a, uh, a word they've never seen before, but how quickly can they do it? You know, that's, um, right. we're, we're doing a lot more of that type of testing too. Yeah, exactly. And for these kids with self dyslexia, one of the only measures that I give that sometimes they will struggle on is a timed test of reading made up words yeah where they're not able to compensate at all with language because yeah. the words are made up and they're timed yeah. so as you say the fluency is a really key piece the fluency is usually not there yeah no for sure that's um no really really important so i, I really appreciate you you bringing that up mm -hmm. um now, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, some of the early signs of dyslexia that you might even observe in a preschooler. Um, but, and you say you've touched on this a little bit already, but I was wondering if you might be able to share a little bit more, uh, you know, around the importance of early uh, identification and, and, and what you might do to, to even treat dyslexia at that age if, if they're not reading yet. Yeah, so the earlier, the better. And I cannot emphasize that enough because Speaking of neuroplasticity or the brain's ability to reorganize for greater efficiency, that is at its height from ages two to seven. So that's called a critical period. And, and it's at its height at about age five. So that's yeah. kindergarten. So yeah. that completely explains why it is so much easier for me to help a kindergartner than a third grader. Yeah. Because the, the kindergartner can so easily reroute those pathways to start using the correct areas of the brain to read because someone with dyslexia is not using the areas of the brain to read that a reader without dyslexia is. And it's so much easier for them to change the way they're using their brain to read at an earlier age. The older they get, the harder it is, especially past age seven. So that when they're getting into second grade, even by then, they've already had all of preschool with the pre-literacy skills that they probably struggled with all of kindergarten and then all of first grade. So three years already of struggling with reading. So by then these patterns of compensating, guessing words, for example, using context are very well ingrained because they've already been kind of doing that for three years. Yeah. So the earlier, the better. And as we were saying, if, you know, be preventative, if they don't turn out to have dyslexia, there's nothing wrong with some enrichment. And at that age, they like it anyway. And that's another huge benefit of early intervention. The little kids that I work with, they think it's fun. I mean, yeah. they have such enthusiasm for learning. 
they're not that far behind their peers. So they don't really view it as therapy or tutoring. It's just kind of teaching. Um, And they think it's class. And that goes a long way too, when the child still has that belief in themselves. Yeah, no, that's huge. I mean, any kind of, um, any kind of treatment for, for anything, right? I mean, just engagement is such a, a huge part of successful outcomes. And, and you're right, the, the, the little, uh, you know, kids, are, they're so into it, right? And, uh, and, and they don't recognize it as being anything sort of outside of normal and, and, and they see it as being fun. It, it was really interesting to hear you talk about that critical period too, um, you know, for language development and, you know, mm-hmm. between two and seven and sort of when this peak is for, uh, you know, really be able to have um, the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak, in terms of reading intervention. Because what it took me back to was the the 2000 National Reading Panel, where they basically said, mm-hmm. like, hey, you've got to do this by age seven. And, and if not, mm-hmm. um, it's not that you can't make progress, but your progress is going to be uh, slower, it's going to take a longer period of time, you're going to require more intensive intervention, right. uh, you know, in order to close the gap for, for all those reasons that you mentioned. That's, um, yeah, it's mm-hmm. fascinating. So, you know, uh, you know, not just for the, the, the little guys then, you know, as, mm-hmm. as kids, you know, even, you know, get older and elementary school and, and even beyond, can, mm-hmm. can you give a sort of a description in terms of what treatment, uh, you know, practically what that actually looks like for, for these guys and, mm-hmm. you know, maybe even what, um, you know, programs you've seen to be, you know, particularly mm-hmm. helpful or, or intervention mm-hmm. strategies have been particularly helpful? So again, I think as dyslexia awareness is increasing, I do think that awareness of Mm Orton-Gillingham as a buzzword is increasing, but I do think there's still some confusion about what that actually is. So there, I think of it as there are kind of tiers of instruction and going up the tier is when the instruction becomes the most powerful. So at the bottom level, I would say is boxed programs. So a boxed Orton-Gillingham program and Orton-Gillingham being a structured multi-sensory method of teaching kids with dyslexia would be like Wilson or uh, Slingerland or Barton. What are some others? Linda Mood Bell. Mm -hmm. Uh, James, are are there any others that I'm forgetting? I'm trying to hit all the ones that people might have heard of. Um, Spire, there's one. Yeah. All, all of Sunday. Yeah. These Sunday's are all, a big one in schools right now. Yes. So these are all what I would call boxed Orton Gillingham programs. They are based on the Orton Gillingham principles of a structured approach where you explain everything, lay everything out, build from easy to hard concepts, do repeated review, right? They all build on that, but it's not personalized for each child. They're really meant to be used with a small group or even yeah. whole class, like a foundations. Yeah. So anything that's boxed is not going to be as effective as an approach that's tailored just for specific students. So I'd say the next step up would be or Orton-Gillingham Pure, which means just using those same principles that I mentioned, structured, multi-sensory, lots of review, prescriptive, but you're choosing materials and approaches for a specific student's level. Mm -hmm. And that's the most effective. The very, very most effective would be delivering that kind of instruction, not a box program in a one-to-one setting. Yeah. And that's kind of the gold standard. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super helpful. I, I, I really appreciate um, you walking through that. And uh, mm-hmm. I think you're right. You know, a lot of people are hearing things like Gordon Gillingham or, or structured literacy instruction. Um, but having those uh, interventions really tailored to the individual needs of the child versus, I mean, probably worst case scenario, right? Just, uh, you know, a, a scripted lesson to a whole classroom of kids, you right. know, um, that that's not individualized. And, you know, uh, you know, what it also sort of makes me think about is when we think about like structured literacy instruction, um, you know, it's sequential, it's explicitly taught, but the other part of that uh, being systematic and, and in my mind, I don't know how you're systematically responding to the needs of the individual student in, unless that intervention is really being delivered based on their unique needs and, and not something that's just so 
so scripted that it's um that it's missing that part of it right and yeah you're you're so right because it is hard to technically hit all of the pillars of Orton Gillingham in a whole group setting because yeah. as you say I mean by nature it is supposed to be diagnostic and prescriptive yeah. and you can only do that to a certain extent in a group and I should also say when I'm mentioning structured literacy I mean Orton Gillingham they are now synonymous as if yeah. we needed another term out there in the literacy world to confuse parents but yeah. those are the same <laughs> yeah no that's a, a good point I, I appreciate you pointing that out <laughs> you know and, and one of the things you touched on there too like obviously the you know kind of gold standard here is going to be it's, it's individualized to um you know, the, the child, you know, um, and then we talked about sort of this, you know, large group being sort of, you know, box programs being probably the worst of the, those options, um, you know, sort of in between there, when you're talking about like, like small group, how would you even define small group? Because I, I'm not sure that, you know, everybody's going to walk away with the same meaning or, you know, parents mm -hmm. are at meetings at school and they're talking about, oh, it's delivered in a small group. What is, in your mm -hmm. mind, what does that actually mean in terms of effective uh, dyslexia remediation? So for me, I do not do anything except one-on-one -on -one yeah. because it is so hard, even when you have just one other student who is the same age, and I've tried it. I've had two first grade boys who were friends and they both had dyslexia and they were kind of on the same level or so I thought, mm -hmm. and I have tried to teach them side by side, did not work because you have no way of predicting how each student is going to respond to whatever your lesson is. It's yeah. going to create a different response in each child, no matter how small, every step of the way. So I would say a small group is two people mm -hmm. because automatically you're not able to really differentiate that much. Yeah. In schools, I've heard of a small group being as many as six or seven children oh, in wow. reading intervention. And that would be a large group in my eyes, yeah. but with you know staff, shortages and so many kids that are now being identified which is great they don't have enough resource teachers to meet the need with the amount of kids being identified so the groups are getting bigger yeah and then it, and then it's no longer sort of individualized to the student yes. and, then, and then if it is um you know they, they can't do that all, all the same time right so you know if they're attempting to do it then they're doing you know, working with one student, moving to the next student, the next student, and then, and then having mm -hmm. a lot of downtime, um, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, some of the challenges delivering these services in schools, right, where, you know, there, there's just sometimes just not enough staffing to go around and be able to provide the, the intensity of intervention that, um, you know, that the children require. Are, are, are there any other sort of challenges, you know, you've experienced working with parents as, as they're, uh, you know, parents are trying to, you know, access these types of supports in school, um, any barriers that they might run into? So the conundrum that I'm always facing when I'm trying to help parents negotiate with the school is what are we fighting for? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, you know, parents are getting more and more well-educated about these issues so they have some sort of sense of what the next step should be. They're kind of aware of that they should be seeking a 504 or an IEP. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, if you're trying to get an IEP, for example, that is not a guarantee if you get the IEP that your child is going to improve for the reasons we just said, because yeah. the intervention is in a quote unquote small group, could be a very large group, using a boxed program may or may not be even delivered by a resource teacher. It could be delivered by an aide. Mm -hmm. There could be a lot of downtime. So there are just a lot of obstacles right now in terms of actually giving the students that have gained resource time the proper intervention to actually move them forward. Yeah. So the problem I'm having with parents right now is not helping their students qualify because most of them are now qualifying. I've seen a, a big jump actually over the last six years. I think schools are getting better at identifying dyslexia, but the intervention is, is kind of still where it was six years ago in terms of yeah. employing the science of reading. It's just not there yet. 
So parents are of course very stressed about how they are going to get the solution because the assessment is not the solution. That's just the guidebook. Yeah. The, no, the whole absolutely. point of it is to know what to do and what knowing what to do can be very hard. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, you've laid out a, a, some of the, um, you know, challenges in, in schools sometimes being able to provide the services that, that kids need and kind of going back to what you were saying earlier in terms of just having a, a boxed program doesn't mean it's being delivered effectively, right? That, that, uh, you know, there's a number of different programs out there, but, but a big part of what, uh, leads to successful outcomes isn't isn't just the program but the the professional that's delivering the program and and their ability to do that effectively and, and meet the unique needs of each kid and it kind of leads into my next question a little bit then you know what do you see the role of you know educational therapists such as yourself um, being in, in supporting kids uh, that have dyslexia you know beyond what they may be getting in schools right so Educational therapists are really filling in this gap, but I see in the future, I ideally, I would hope that educational therapists will be more, schools will make use of us more in terms of delivering this intervention. Mm. Because no matter what, they're just with the statistics, right? One in five people has dyslexia. They're not gonna ever hire enough staff to serve the proportion of the student body that has dyslexia. So yeah. what I would hope for the future, what a model would be is letting educational therapists come on campus to work with kids that have dyslexia. I am able to do that at private schools, but mm -hmm. I'm not able to do that at public schools. And I know that's a universal thing among ed therapists and just private support providers in general, like OTs, SLPs, I, yeah. I think we're vital and we could really relieve some of the stress from the resource team, Yeah, really, just by being an extra source of support that can be delivered one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as it is now, of course, educational therapy has to be done outside of school, after school, and it can take so many different forms. I mean, for me, I only work with kids that are pretty young. So third grade and below primarily. Mm -hmm. And we are just working on filling in the gaps. Now I mentioned earlier, I don't work on homework. My mm -hmm. kids don't even have homework. And yeah. you, we're really doing the very, very basic level building blocks. But educational therapists for older kids, kids that are in middle school can be super helpful in helping with not only homework, but executive functioning. And all that goes with managing your homework, managing yeah. deadlines, studying for tests, organizing your materials and your time. For sure. And generally, as students age out of services with me, because I, I, again, I only really work on the, the very basic level skills, a lot of them, as they get older, do end up transitioning to working with an, an executive functioning coach to help manage the homework load. But again, not just um, having a, a tutor help them with the work, but actually helping them understand how to study the best way for their own processing style. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you, you know, covering not only what you do as an ed therapist, but, you know, how, um, you know, young people can benefit from ed therapists as they get older and, and uh, sort of move through their school years. Um, I really just love your idea too around, you know, the ability of an ed therapist to be able to provide services to kids during the school day. And yeah, I'm, I'm aware of it too, just in terms of you know, some of the barriers that exist right now for people being able to do that in public school settings. And it's really too bad, you know, I mean, you know, what you described and the ability to go in and provide those services during the school day, um, you know, not only really help the student, but to be able to provide it during that time frame too. So they're you know, they're not going to six and a half hours of school and then coming home and, you know, spending X amount of time, you know, doing right. therapy X number of days a week too, which is, it, uh, it's, it's critical. It, it, it's necessary, you know, for these kids, mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to do that. Um, but, but it is, it's a lot of work, you know, these, um, you know, these kids are working really hard. Right. Right. And I guess I should also mention people also ask me this quite often. Educational therapists are not able to be employed by school districts either because you have to have 
a res a resource cred I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm correct on this or what yeah. the name is. a resource credential yeah, or credential. a resource a special education degree master something like that so there mm -hmm. is no comparable category yeah. that net therapist could fill and same thing we can't work as you know independent contractors with the district because like there are independent contractor OTs because that's comparable to the school OT but yeah and a therapist is not comparable to resource teachers so all those doors that. are really closed which yeah. is a shame but i do really believe in the future with the demand just increasing and all these kids getting identified schools will start thinking outside the box i hope yeah or maybe it may be some shifts in the regulations that you know that dictate right. you know, some of the things that you just described too because mm -hmm. yeah i didn't think about that but but yeah those would be um you know those do become just sort of logistical barriers for schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, you know, Natalie, this has been amazing. I, I can't believe, um, you know, the, the ground we've covered and just all the wonderful information you've shared today like, for people that are, that are listening to this podcast. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, for those who are interested, how do they get a hold of you and learn more about your services? So you can find me at my website, natalielptherapy.com. Feel free to email me, natalielptherapy at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram at natalielptherapy. And if anyone has a question about anything that I have shared, I would really love to hear from you. So do not hesitate to reach out. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And um, uh, what I'll, I'll do also is, is when I post uh, the podcast, I'll, I'll include your contact information there too. So people have it there as well. Okay, perfect. Awesome. And, you know, of course, um, you know, for those who, who are interested in, in learning more about the services that we provide as well, um, you can always visit the Byland Clinic at www.thebylandclinic.com. Um, I'm trying to get better about it, but, uh, but you can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at the Byland Clinic, or of course, reach out uh, directly at info at drjamesbyland.com. Um, I mean, as always, I'm just super grateful uh, for those of you out there that are taking time out of your busy lives to, to listen to our conversation today. And um, it's, it's been such a valuable conversation. Now that I can't, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on and doing this. Like I said, um, you know, when I, when I imagined doing this, you were the first person that came to mind. And, uh, uh, and, and it just everything today just kind of reaffirmed that that initial thought oh. I had. I mean, this has been just a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate oh. it. That is so kind. Thank you so much. And it, it's been really nice to talk to you about it too, because as I said at the beginning, we are like-minded. And I know that everything that I am saying resonates with you as well. And it's just wonderful to have colleagues that are, are like-minded and, and get what your practice is all about. So yeah, thank no, you, for James. Sure. Well, and, and, you know, and not just the listeners. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I enjoy doing these things and listening to you, to you share your ideas because I'm always learning something too. This is, um, you know, uh, I, wonderful for everybody else listening, but um, really just an interesting conversation for me too. And, and, and I'm definitely taking notes here as well as you're talking. So I, I, <laughs> oh, I really appreciate it. Okay, All right. No, well, thanks, awesome, James. Natalie. Yeah, no, thank you so much.